The white tree was the physical embodiment of Gondor's ancient Numenorean heritage. Yet while it had died awaiting the return of the king, by its side remained the living, breathing guardians of the realm, who too could trace their proud heritage to the days of Numenor, and had dutifully passed on the torch of the throne's vigil for countless generations. These walking monuments to the glorious past were known as the guards of the Fountain Court. Today, let us delve into their hallowed history. You can lead your own champions into battle with our sponsor Bloodline Heroes of Lethas. It's a fantasy RPG where you build your kingdom and collect champions with which to mount a defense of your lands and the world. The game's unique Bloodline feature allows you to create characters by mixing traits from the elves, dwarves, orcs, lichens, demons, demigods, and more. The new hybrid system allows for further customization with not only inherited talents and traits, but also unique appearances for over 800 new hybrids between any two bloodlines. With new characters added every month, the possibilities are endless. This Halloween, the game is adding a brand new lineage, the Accursed, which are a terrifying race of deadly wraith lords. By participating in the holiday event starting on October 27th, you can unlock a free Accursed Champion on the 7th day of play. So download the game now for free on Android or iOS by using my link in the description or scanning the QR code on the screen. These will reward you with a special starter pack worth $20. Enjoy! The guards of the Fountain Court, known interchangeably as the Citadel Guard or the Tower Guard, can trace their origins back to the long tradition of men who have defended both the great kings of the Numenorean line and the White Tree, which came to symbolize their rule. This would have begun in the early years of the Second Age, when the ancient Dúnedain had followed the star of Eärendil to make their home upon the newly raised Isle of Elena. Here they would found a series of cities, which together rose to become the Kingdom of Númenor. Its long-lived monarchs would reign for generations, carefully guiding the Númenóreans from the capital of Armenolos. It is in the king's court that the first white tree was planted. Known as Nimloth the Fair, it had been given as a gift of friendship by the elves of Toleresia. For much of the Second Age, the kings of Numenor tended to it as carefully as they did their own realm. Yet they did not manage such affairs alone. At their side was an entire court of advisors, administrators, and commanders. It is likely that from among those close companions were a chosen few who were given the honour of serving as the first royal bodyguards. Duties for such units would have ranged from securing the White Tree to protecting the palace, the royal family, and the monarch themselves. Most time was therefore spent in the various power centres of Numenor. However, over the centuries, the reach of the kings, and therefore their guard, would extend far into the sea and beyond. Such was the strength of Golden Age Numenor, for instance, that its armies came to dominate much of Middle-earth, and even forced Sauron into submission without a single battle. Yet while they appeared indomitable by external foes, it would be from the inside that the strength of men would falter. Increasingly, the line of Elros Tar Minyatar, the first king of Númenor, fell away from the light of the Valar, neglecting the White Tree and the people. This culminated in the reign of the 25th king, ar Farazan. Corrupted by Sauron and turned to the worship of Morgoth, he would have the White Tree felled. This madness would ultimately lead to the fall of Númenor. However, owing to the courage of Isildur and the foresight of Elendil, the faithful managed to escape this cataclysm with both their lives and a fruit of the White Tree. Guided by the winds, they would set foot upon the shores of Middle-earth, and it is here that the survivors of Númenor regrouped and planted the seeds of a new future. In the year 3320 of the Second Age, these survivors joined with other Numenorians, earlier colonists, and local peoples to form the realms in exile, known as Arnor and Gondor. Elendil would serve as the High King of the realms in exile, and ruled them from his seat in Arnor, whilst his sons Isildur and Anarion jointly governed the south as the Kings of Gondor. Within a century, this new realm would rise to great heights, with the White Tree once again finding itself planted in the court of Numenorean kings. 
It would be tended to in the Gondorian fortress palace of Minas Ithiop by a new set of royal guards who took up their vigil over the dark lands to the east. Yet Sauron too had regained his strength, and now fresh armies poured out of Mordor, and in 3429 of the Second Age these overran the borders of Gondor, taking Minas Ithil and destroying the White Tree along with its guard. However, Isildur managed to escape with the seedling once again, and would soon return with the vast armies of the Last Alliance. This mighty host pushed back Sauron in the Battle of Dagolad, and finally defeated him following a grueling seven-year siege of Barad-dûr. Though this was a great victory, it had come at a heavy cost. Many brave men fell, and the realms of Arnor and Gondor would be crippled by the losses, which claimed both of their kings and many of their heirs. Thus, the dawn of the Third Age saw both realms struggling to recover and ultimately split apart following the disaster of the Gladden Fields. Each would slowly heal over the following centuries, however, despite a promising recovery, Arnor suffered from long-term trends which led to its decline. In 861 of the Third Age, the North further fractured into three petty kingdoms, and weakened by infighting, these would fall one by one to the armies of the Witch King of Angmar. Meanwhile, the more populous and prosperous Kingdom of Gondor endured. The third white tree was replanted in the court of the fountain at Minas Tirith, thus inaugurating a new watch for the royal guard of Gondor, which would last over a thousand years. And let us now turn to a description of these very forces. Owing to their long tenure, the kit of these men would have varied over the years. However, they had always stood as the best of the best, and were thus equipped with some of the highest quality and most ornate gear their age had to offer. For defence, this often meant donning a padded vest, over which was worn a base layer of chainmail. The most extensive of such hauberks were long-sleeved, and fed at least to the mid-thigh. In addition, the chest could be further protected by a breastplate, while extremities were in turn covered by a combination of tassets, pauldrons, arm guards, gauntlets and greaves. Altogether, these provided excellent coverage and were a canvas upon which to display the mastery of Gondorian smiths. Characteristically, however, it was only the guard troops who were entitled to adorn such armour with the livery of Elendil. This look would have been further enhanced by the work of Gondorian tailors, who fashioned exquisite skirts, cloaks and tabards, which turned such men into walking monuments to the glorious past. But one of the most unique items of the Fountain Guard were their helmets. These were tall, high-crowned pieces wrought in the Numenorean style and forged of mithril. Their distinctive feathered crests were made from the plumage of seabirds, meant to honour the ocean-faring heritage of Gondor. And such helmets were treasured heirlooms of ancient times, which some even believe to be gifts given by the dwarves long ago. But that was not all. Last, but by no means least, came the shield. Such pieces were constructed in the typical Gondorian fashion. As such, they were made of a thick wooden board, reinforced with metalwork along the edges. Its face was painted black, and often featured the contrasting emblem of the White Tree. For offence, the guard was said to be proficient with many weapons. The most common, though, was the long winged spear. Those protrusions had their origins from boar spears meant to prevent over-penetration, and in battle they could serve the same purpose, or might assist with spear fencing. The second most common weapon was the sword. At times it was used as a primary weapon, but for the most part seems to have made its appearance as a ceremonial short sword. Once again, such pieces were masterfully wrought, and would have been treasured belongings passed down through the generations. Altogether, a fully equipped guard of the Fountain Court was a formidable threat on the battlefield. However, donning one's full kit was impractical, and these soldiers would have dressed down significantly while on duty. And this often meant wearing just a few key pieces of armour along with a uniform of black robes and black surcoats embroidered in white. In addition, they would always carry a sheathed sword and often a spear. With the individual guardsmen thus described, Let's now turn our attention to their broader organisation, and while this varied over time, it seems that their unit was typically divided into companies. Each was led by a captain under the overall command of a captain general, chosen from among the high ranks of the military or nobility. 
Together, these were at the direct disposal of the Crown. During the golden age of Gondor's military strength, guard companies would have boasted several hundreds of men each, with perhaps dozens of companies in service at a time. In times of war, these numbers swelled, and in times of peace, they were relaxed. Such fluctuations were natural, but it was in the interest of the king to maintain at least a healthy baseline number to preserve the martial readiness of the realm. Yet when Gondor began to decline, so too did the guard. For instance, by the time of the War of the Ring, it had largely withered away, being reduced to around three companies, with a total strength of just a few hundred, if even that. Yet regardless of their numbers, the guard always made its home within the city of Minas Tirith, and more precisely, they occupied its seventh and highest level. It was there, in the most important tier of the city, that the court of the fountain and the white tree were located, beyond which lay the citadel and the throne of Gondor. And finally, climbing from the court of the fountain and towering over all the city, stood the white tower of Ecthelion. It is within the base of this last structure that the guard had its own storerooms and a small dining halls. Over time, various other rooms could have also served as small armories and a barracks for some of the men. However, additional buildings likely existed on lower levels of the White City to quarter the full guard and provide them with the necessary facilities to sustain themselves. As for the duties of the guard, their primary obligation was to defend the seventh level of Minas Tirith. Specifically, this meant posting watchmen and circulating patrols between its gates, palatial grounds, and of course, around the White Tree. In this capacity, they were oath-bound never to leave their post, unless expressly commanded to by their lord. However, in earlier ages, they had played a more active role across Minas Tirith, functioning as a police force for the wider city. At the same time, they also served beyond its walls. After all, the guard was tasked with defending the king wherever he went, both in peace and in war. Thus, they served as a roaming bodyguard force that might one year participate in a leisurely tour of the realm, while the next year taking position in the vanguard of a military campaign. It should be noted, though, that in the time of the stewards, the guard's role was much reduced. Without the true king present, their protection to this interim ruler only extended so far as the walls of the upper level. Thus it was at the time of the War of the Ring, the small number of guardsmen would remain confined to the seventh level, even as the city came under siege by the forces of Mordor. Yet even still, once the terms of their oath compelled them to act, they would fight to the death. Now let us turn to a discussion of their service history. We can pick up where we last left off with the planting of a new white tree at the start of the Third Age. Things here initially began quite poorly for the guard. Men of their company were likely with King Isildur when his party was ambushed and slaughtered by orcs near the Gladden Fields. And in the aftermath, the guard was left to rebuild itself in order to protect the heirs of Anarion, who took up rule of Gondor. Starting with Menelil, these successors slowly raised it to a new great height of glory, and over the centuries the borders of the Southern Realm expanded further and further across Middle-earth. However, their power would be challenged by the rising force of the Easterlings. These had long feuded with the men of the West, which ultimately precipitated their invasion of Gondor in 490 of the Third Age. This would kick off a bloody series of wars spread over several centuries. They featured many ferocious battles between the two powers, which even saw the eighth Gondorian king, Remendakil, slain along with his bodyguard. However, his son and the remaining companies of guardsmen led a vengeful counter-offensive that expelled the Eastlings from Gondor in 541 and eventually saw large portions of Rhun conquered by 550. With the East subdued, Gondor could thus devote more of its attention to matters at home, and this soon led to the dawn of a new Golden Age, as the realm enjoyed centuries of unparalleled power. The height of this power came to be known as the Time of the Ship Kings in the 9th to 12th centuries, and would see Gondorian armies wage campaigns of conquest east to the shores of the Sea of Rune, and south to the lands of Umba, west to the river Guathlo, and north to the forests of Mirkwood. Spearheading these assaults would have been elite guard and veteran units who carried the banner of the White Tree across countless battlefields. They even extended their reach to the lands of Harad, forcing the distant Oliphant lords to pay tribute to the throne of Gondor. Following these wars were long centuries of well-earned peaceful prosperity, 
It was in this time that many jealous neighbours whispered of how, in Gondor, precious stones are but pebbles for the children to play with. For the men of Gondor, this must have been a time to bask in the glorious achievement of their fathers, whilst enjoying the fruits of the stability they had been handed. However, it was not long before such comforts turned to decadence, and a gradual decline set in. The kinstrife of the 15th century was a particularly bloody civil war, which further plunged Gondor into decline. It saw the sacking of Osgiliath, the loss of a palantir, many Gondorian lives lost, and ranks of the nobility slain. In such matters the existing guard must have been torn apart by the infighting. As various factions rose and fell, companies might have had to shift allegiances or been purged in the process. It's likely that new guard units may even have been formed to protect leaders from either side. The half-blooded Eldakar eventually came out on top, and the kingdom's population was partially replenished by a new wave of northern immigrants from Ravania. Both of these were a sign of the fading high bloodline of Numenor, which now gave way to the shorter-lived and less sturdy stock of middlemen. This was further exacerbated by the Great Plague of the 17th century, which devastated the people of Middle-earth. The King of Gondor fell to the plague along with the White Tree, and it was truly a dark time. The fourth generation of the White Tree was replanted in 1640 of the Third Age, signalling new hope. Gondor slowly recovered, but was again buffeted by the 19th century invasion of the Wain Riders. These bloody affairs saw the northern army of Gondor destroyed, but survivors, along with the southern army, eventually repelled the Easterners. Shortly thereafter, the king and his sons would be killed, leading to a crisis of succession. Iarnil II was eventually crowned, which granted the realm some stability, and this allowed his son and successor Iarnur to lead a successful campaign north, which finally defeated the witch king of Angmar. However, the Nazgul were not so easily defeated, and they captured Minas Ithil, renaming it Minas Morgul, and issued a challenge to the king of Gondor. After a time, Iarnor rode with a small company of knights, likely including members of the royal guard, to meet the challenge of the lord of the Nazgul, and face him in single combat. Iarnor and his company were never seen again, and the line of Anarion ended. With the king missing, rather than confirmed dead, a line of stewards came to power who would look after the throne in his stead. This vigil would last for 1,000 years, and in this time the royal guard too was left in a state of suspension, awaiting the return of the king. For a while, they may still have played an active role in the front lines of Gondor's wars, and if so, this would have seen them deployed against the various incursions from Mordor, the Eastlings, and Umbar over the coming centuries. However, by the time of Sauron's terrible return in 2954, Gondor and her armies were but a pale shadow of their former selves. In this period, the guard was diminished to one of a more ceremonial role, isolated atop the highest levels of Minas Tirith, alongside the last white tree, which had withered away with no offspring. Yet nonetheless, they did not fade from relevance entirely. And during the War of the Ring, famous members of the guard included Beregrond, Peregrine Took and their Captain General, Boromir. Boromir took command according to the apparent tradition, whereby the position would be given to the heir to the throne, or heir to the stewardship in this case. Pippin's role in the guard is somewhat of an anomaly, since he did not officially join the ranks, and instead served more as a personal esquire of Stuart Denethor II. Beregrond, on the other hand, was a true soldier of the Third Guard Company, and he has a fascinating story to tell. He, like all guardsmen, were charged with the defence of the citadel, and forbidden from abandoning their post even at the height of the siege of Minas Tirith. Yet he would break this strict code upon hearing from Pippin that Denethor, having abandoned all hope, intended to burn Faramir alive. Together they rushed to the Rath Dinan, and there called upon the guard to come to their senses and prevent this madness. When they instead stood resolute, Beregrond was forced to fight his way in slaying fellow guardsmen in the process. Such an act, perpetrated on such hallowed ground, was punishable by death. Yet thankfully, it succeeded by providing Gandalf an opening to enter the hall and save Faramir. Later, 
The newly crowned King Aragorn saw the great love which drove this deed and showed mercy. Beragrond was thus merely stripped of his rank as a citadel guardsman and banished from the city. But at the same time, he was elevated as captain of Faramir's guard. Following the War of the Ring, Beragrond would follow Faramir, now the steward and prince of Athelion, to make their new home in Emun Arnon. In this age of the king, the rest of the guard would be granted new opportunities. And so they accompanied Aragorn once more onto the field of battle against the enemies of Gondor. In the campaigns that followed, they regained their place of honor, rising to new heights in the Fourth Age, the Age of Man. We hope you have enjoyed this look at the history of Middle-earth through the lens of Gondor's most stalwart defenders. But what other units from Tolkien's work would you like to see us cover next? A big thanks to the patrons for funding the channel and to our team of researchers, writers, artists and editors for bringing this episode to life. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.